we're finishing up friction today, so we're going to do a little problem here that kind of combines uh, a lot of things we've been looking at. So here's a beam simply supported at one end with a uniform load. Just to keep things a little simpler, we don't have to complicate everything in here. Um, four meters, 200 newton meters, so. And on the right end, we have a post in support with coefficient of friction between the top of the post and the beam of 0.2 and between the bottom of the beam and the ground of uh, 0.5. Now that little beam is a meter long and right at the midpoint not, sorry, not at the midpoint at a, a point part way down is uh, a force that's actually trying to pull that post out. So this is the kind of thing you'd want to do when your the person who jilted you is getting married. You sneak to the the reception and you pull out the post uh, for the the and screw up the reception. I don't, have you done this? <laughs> No, I didn't do this because I couldn't solve this problem. <laughs> so that, that post is a meter long and the, the force is uh, off center at somewhere 0.25 meters up from the bottom. So I think that's all the details we need. And we want to find the smallest P to move the post. So, what's going on at the post that uh, would affect that and would uh, would mean I need to use the words to find the smallest p. Why isn't there just a single p that that will do it? Why isn't there just a just like we used to find p? Why is there a smallest p? Because that implies that there's p's that won't do it, P's it'll overdo it. Wow. Doesn't that answer your question? What? Does that answer your question? Yeah, but why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. I have an answer to my question. <laughs> no, but why is that the case? Why is it the case that there are smaller P's and and that underdo it and large P's that overdo it. No, that doesn't answer my question. My question is why is there? <laughs> Not are there. Well, depending how much force you pull on it. I mean, but there's still a threshold of movement, right? Because of? Because of static friction. Because of the friction. We remember you've got to get to a point where one of them will start to move and then the post will move. But which one moves first? Got to figure that out. So we'll need a free body diagram. There's P that we're looking for. What other forces? 
We're trying to pull the post out, so there's going to be two friction forces. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll label the ends. Call that A, B, and C. So I guess that would be the friction at B. What about the bottom one? Which direction? Same. Yeah, we're trying to pull the post out. Those two friction forces are trying to hold it in. What else? The normal forces. We don't have a friction force without some normal force. So there's some force here at B from the beam on top of it. And then there's some force down here, the normal force from the ground. Other forces, well I guess the only other one possible is if the post had weight, but it doesn't. All right, how do we solve this one? Yeah, well, we'll need to find out the reaction B here, but how do we solve the friction part of it? How do we solve this part of it? Because find out what B is, that's the easy part. You, you, you dopes could have done that months ago. How do we find, how do we handle the friction part of it? Are these two the same? Not necessarily. They could be, but not necessarily. But what's more important than that is what's going to happen at those two places? It's not a couple. What's most likely to happen is that one of those will slip before the other one. Either the top will pop out and the bottom won't move very far and, the, and to our delight the deck will fall with everybody on it, including our, our evil ex. <laughs> or the bottom will slip out and, and still the deck will fall and we're still happy. So, so in terms of a personal outcome here, we can't <laughs> lose. <laughs> but which one happens first? They just have the same normal force at each of them, right? There's no weight in the, in the beam. Yeah, B and C are the same, so you just sum the forces in the Y direction, and B, B will get from finishing that business up there. It should only take you a couple seconds to do that, since it's a uniform load. Once we have B and C, though, what do we do? Multiply them by their use. Huh? Multiply them by their use. Well, you can. Remember I told you we had three types of possible problems. Friction problems. Three types of possible friction problems. Remember I told you that? Yeah, you wrote it down. zero all the way up to some maximum and we don't know where it is so if we calculate mu times the normal force what are we assuming when we do that we're assuming we're at the maximum but it might not be so what do we do what are the three types of Problems I gave you. Okay, impending motion. One, 
one of the surfaces, or maybe both, I guess, it could happen, are right at that maximum. They're ready to slip. A little bit more pull, and they'll slip, and we'll be victorious in ruining the reception. So that's type one. Type two was what? That's when they actually are moving, and we want to figure out what the friction forces are. But uh, we don't even have the kinetic coefficient, so that's not our concern. And what was the third one? Okay. We're, we're kind of at one and two. What we have to do is assume uh, either B or C is ready to slip. What's it mean to assume that? What then, in terms of the calculation, do we do that says we assume that? We put one of those at that maximum friction force. So maybe we assume, assume uh, B does, then we say FB equals mu S times B. Then what? Then what can we do? So that's that's uh, that's essentially a given into this free body free body diagram. It's as if we just happen to know one of the values because that's a straightforward calculation. Then what? Almost. That's almost right. We're real close. Assume a value for this. You can find out what this is. And then compare this not to this maximum force, but to its own maximum. Because it has a different value for the static coefficient. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll call this mu b. Maybe mu s v. So we compare this one, and if it exceeds its maximum, then we know our assumption was wrong. If it doesn't exceed its maximum, then we know it's, the assumption was okay. And then we'll have the answer, which one slips first. Not in the mood to actually do that, though. Well, I thought I had done it. Then we can find FC and then we can compare FC to the maximum possible lift. And if the calculated FC exceeds that maximum, then we know our assumption was wrong, we have to do it the other way. But either way, uh, a value of P is going to come out of it. One is based on a bad assumption, one's based on a good assumption. So, make sense? Don't look at her. Does it make sense to you? No. <laughs> All right, well, let's go through it then. Let's see. I need some space. Uh, 
So we'll assume that this is impending, that the slip is impending there. Then we have B yet. It's symmetric, so half of each, that's got to be 400. B's got to be 400. Okay, so there's an 80, 80 newtons. Now we can figure out, uh, based on that assumption, figure out what P and uh, FC are. If FC exceeds, actually we don't need P, we got to check that first. So if you can find out with somebody, just come up with that. Is there some way you can come up with just FC without having to find P as well? Because if we don't need if, if FC is too big, then no reason to find C. I mean, sorry, P. We know C happens to be 400 as well. sideways and not turn one way or the other. We don't know that. Only way it could pull out and stay vertical is if both were at their maximum at the same time. Because one will reach the maximum first and then you keep pulling the other one will rise till it meets that and then it will slip out. But there's no reason to assume that this will slide out vertically that's going to tip one way or the other because one of these is going to be at its impending motion and the other isn't, isn't there yet. So what's FC? Anybody know? Given that FB we have assumed to be 80 newtons. How if we sum the moments about point P, if that's what that is? That way we don't have to find out what P is, we can just find out what FC is, and we can check it. So FC times 0.25. Meters must equal FB times 0.75 meters. Is that right? That's just uh, the moments about P. Newtons. 
which means that FC is greater than FC max. Meaning what? means our assumption, assuming that this was at impending motion, that this was just ready to slip is wrong. So you now have to redo it with this at the limit of 200 meters. Uh, sorry, 200 newtons. And you have to redo that. Then you can find out what P is as well. Um, that's just a matter of summing the forces horizontally. So our assumption is wrong. So now you have to assume that this is at impending motion. This is 200 newtons. Then you can find out what P and B are. In fact, you don't need to know what, uh, not B, but FB. Is that a like, process of elimination, or could this be wrong too? No, because uh, imagine P starting up getting higher and higher and higher, when this one hits 200, it's going to slip. Right. This one won't slip unless this was already up to 240, which 40. it can't reach. Okay. Because it. it's going to slip before that. So you've got these, <coughs> these two, two things going on. As P goes up, You know, if P is, is, is too low to move these, then uh, they're going to go up by uh, the ratio of their distances away from P. So they're each going to do something different, I guess. And they have different maximums. So one of those is going to hit its maximum first. It's going to slip. And then that one's just going to rotate out. So it won't, won't reach its maximum. It'll be back here. So with what you just said about the top one's not going to slip until FC gets to 240, which you can't happen. Doesn't that mean the bottom is kind of slip? No, no. The limit on the bottom one is 240. What's the limit on the top? The limit on the top one is is 80. Now you redo this with that at its limit. No, its limit's 200, not 240. This one, we know, is going to be below the limit because it was only when that one was bigger that this one was above the limit. And we don't need that one now anyway. You can find it if you want. And now you can find out what the P is such that this doesn't move. And this has a force of 200. So I think some of the moments about B would make sense. So P times 0.75 equals 200 times 1. Equals 
What is that, 150? No. That's not right. 266 and 30. It's what? 267. Yeah, 267. So you know that FB must be the difference between those two, 67, which is below its limit. So it doesn't slip. The bottom one slips. No, Alan? Do we have to do this? To let you sleep right here? <laughs> You're not comfortable. You're not. You're not comfortable with that. No, I'm good. I just. Uh, I'm just. It's just wondering when B is going to slip if it if it all. B slip. won't slip because C will come out. B will not slip. Just rotate. And then the beam will fall. And you you better head for the woods. Get the bread. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's. Now, the rest of us will head for the woods. You're not pulling on this. You're just there. You're, you're spying. I'm pushing it. It's probably looking up through the deck boards. Under the dresses. Oh, no. <laughs> notice, notice he immediately knew where that was going. Okay. All right. Maybe you need another one then. Let's see. Now, this one. Imagine you're moving a refrigerator. 350 pounds. And you're pushing on it with all your might. Very impressive. Coefficient of static friction between the bottom of the refrigerator and the floor is 0.24. And that distance there is 14 inches, and this distance there is 60 inches. Find the force. To just make it slip. So find the minimum the minimum force. Anything over that and it will actually slip. We want to find the minimum force just to make it slip. So no, the answer is not zero. But that was a good try. I'm sure somebody was coming up to it. This one's this one's a, a little bit different. In terms of the understanding of it. Oops, I don't want floor for a free body diagram. Sorry, W is three hundred and fifty pounds.
So we've got the three body diagram. one again we have to uh, since we're looking for the point of impending slip we know that one of these has to be right at its maximum actually for it to slip they most both must be right at their maximum because we can't have one leg slipping without the other slipping too. So they're not going to slip until both of them are at their maximum. And it can't be such that one reaches the maximum first and then keeps going because it can't go above that maximum. So it's going to reach a maximum and as F increases, the other one is going to increase up to its maximum too. Once they're both at their maximum, then it will slip. So we have to assume both of these are at their maximum. Then we can figure out what the, the force should be. Once we've done that, we have to check something else. So put both of those at their maximum. Because it's not going to slip if one's at the maximum and the other's not beyond that point yet. Or not up to that point yet. That point was, that, uh, that leg would still hold. Does that make sense? I think so. A little more subtle. Trouble is, you don't know what A and B are. So you have to come up with those. So that has to do with the uh, with the torus involved. That looks like one of the creatures from Pac-Man. I said that. I think that's, I think that's it. You know, the same thing I was thinking when I was drawing that refrigerator. It looks like a pac yeah, creature. Yeah, you guys. Oh, my goodness. You're yeah, shrinking. Now you guys all say that. I'm like, oh, yeah. There's a couple of out there. <laughs> it's not bad. I was going to draw a refrigerator. BJ, not bad. Well, they changed a lot. They got this. They, they rounded off, they got fatter for most of you. There's some point you're going to have the whole technical free and sketching again. Take away the one credit some of you got. There's some point in this where the force would tip it over. Well, that's what we have to check next. Once you've got these, then you have to check to see would it have tipped first. Because putting both these to the max, but you don't know A and B. So you just put them at mu s a and mu s b find out what a and b are and then check one of them to see if it's beyond the maximum if it is then you know it tipped first because this is symmetrical can you assume that a and b is the same you sure you can Assume any stupid thing you want to assume. It's not symmetrical. <laughs> the refrigerator itself is symmetrical, but the load's not. You have this load up here, 
And so we know B is going to be greater than A. So either the thing slips or B hangs up and it tips over, but you have to check those separately. You can't check those both at the same time. So to put the assumption in, the best we can do is say that this force we're looking for must equal mu s a plus b. Just since they both had the same coefficient, I just pulled that out. That's assuming they're both at their maximum. Assuming that it will slip. We're right at the point of slipping. Trouble is we don't know what either of those are. So then what? Yeah, apply the moment and do it probably about one of these points or the other um, just because it eliminates it only one over the other. What? It only eliminates one, you still have two unknowns, so would yeah. you want to do it in front of the force and in the line of one of those? Yeah. Well, we have a third equation. We have, we have one, two, three, four, five unknowns except we're sort of eliminating one with this equation. This is actually two equations. So we have five equations. We should be able to solve for them. So maybe pick point A. Assume the, the moments are zero about that. That should allow you to find B. Then you can find A because you know A plus B equals the weight. Then you can check to see if uh, either of these at, at its maximum. B is actually the more dangerous spot just because B's got to be bigger than A because of the torque caused by F. So B is the one you want to check, which makes even more sense to sum the moments about A. Uh, 
so we also know W equals A plus B. So So F, we can put this in, and then we have, then we can eliminate um, B from here. No, then we can solve for B, I think. Okay, all the units check. B. What? At three fifty-five. It's like magic. So that's like one of those commercials where you go take a Bud Light out and two more appear. <laughs> because B is greater than the the, the B is greater than it could be. Couldn't possibly be that. Yeah. <laughs> so that means it's going to tip. Once uh, F reaches a certain point, when B equals 350, then uh, then you know A is no longer in contact because A has reached zero at that point, and so therefore it's going to tip. Then you can redo the problem 
and find how low can H be so that it doesn't tip and then it does slip. And if you redo that, we don't have time for that, it uh, comes out to be about 58.3 inches. So you just have to lower it a little bit and it would slip. Turns out very interestingly too, if you do that, it's independent of F. No matter what force you push with, if you push at 58.3 inches or below, it will slip rather than, than tip. So once you're below that 58.3, you cannot come up with a big enough force to tip it, it's always going to slide first. So, I want all of you to go home. The refrigerators are at a maximum now, as they always are right after Thanksgiving, and test it.